distinguished people. I'm honored to be aligned with the pro-life movement. For the first time in my life, I'm sorry to say, but I have never met a better bunch of people. As the first Ray was saying, I received a baptism of fire into the pro-life movement on September 13th at 6.55 p.m. My phone rang with my daughter's phone number showing. We had just returned her back to her home in Hyannis, Massachusetts, after spending a wonderful summer together. And we were so glad to hear her voice. She was such a bubble, such an optimist, always brought joy. Laura was adopted. We got her when she was four and a half. She was abandoned at birth, nearly died in a hospital, in an orphanage for a few years, and adopted by another family when they got her home from Honduras, decided they didn't want her. We got the phone call, and um, I, because I took in foster children, I drove down to Philadelphia to get her. It was the joy of my life. I thought we were doing her a great service. It wound up we were the ones who were really blessed. My prayer, five minutes after getting that phone call, was that the Lord would bring something good out of her death that I could bear it. I thought if a few girls would hear her story and not have an abortion, that would help my grief. That happened the first week. Ten days after her death, I met with the doctor. I spoke with him for an hour and a half. After getting all the facts I wanted, I asked the Lord what he would have me say to the doctor. And I said these words, they came out of my mouth. The blood of my daughter is on your hands. The blood of my grandchild is on your hands. The blood of every life you've ever taken is on your hands. One day you will stand before the judge of all eternity and answer for every one of them, unless you stop doing what you're doing and repent and spend the rest of your life for life. I said, your mother gave you life. Only God is the giver of life. Only God can take away life. And he looked at me and said, Mrs. Smith, I know those Bible stories. I was raised by Presbyterians. I said, you may know the stories, but you don't know the God of the story because you could not do what you do. I left that meeting thinking, God, is this your purpose? Will he stop doing abortions? I foolishly thought he would stop willingly because I asked him on the life of my daughter to promise me that he would consider stopping doing abortions. He said he would consider it. Well, the Lord didn't want to wait for him to consider because a few months after that, on February 20th, his license was revoked by the Medical Board of Massachusetts. He was considered a danger to public safety after they did their investigation. But you'll never hear that because after it was suspended and he was declared a danger to public safety, he relinquished his license, which automatically closes the file. They will never know he killed my daughter. It's just written as a disciplinary action. That's how the medical profession, if there's any doctors in here, <laughs> nothing intended, but they protect their own. So I'm pursuing a criminal case to get this man exposed. He's a teacher, he travels all over the world, he's very distinguished in his career. But my daughter died from lack of oxygen. That's all she needed was air. And I had told people an intern would have known better. But I wanted to tell you our family was pro-life. Laura was raised in a pro-life home. That may shock you that she chose to have an abortion. It shocked me. It shocked my very foundation. We were pro-life. Uh, I bought Laura a promise ring when she was a young teenager, which she wore. She was engaged to be married. Her fiancé was just shipped over to Iraq. And there's, a, there's questions that I'll never have answers to until I see her again, and maybe then it won't matter. But. Um, I've made it my passion to speak out against this, so this won't happen to another family. I guess I took it for granted. My daughter would come home in tears when her fellow classmates would have abortions. I never, <coughs> never thought that it was on her radar screen. I never thought she would even consider an abortion. But as I said, I was pro-life, but I kept it quietly in my heart. Of course, I talked to my children about it. Not graphically, just about the word abortion. I never got graphic. I regret that today. Something happened between the church door and the abortion clinic. And I don't know if Laura bought the blob of tissue line. I really believe if she had seen an ultrasound with 10 little figures and 10 little toes, she would have been unable to do what she did. But that's a conversation for another time. 
What I would say to you pro-life people, so many have come up to me since my daughter's death and said they had found out that their own child had an abortion. And they survived the abortion, thank God, but maybe I wish I had talked to Laura more. If you ever get into trouble, if you ever find yourself pregnant, don't be afraid to come to us. We love you. We'll help you. We'll do whatever we can. Have that conversation with your child. I wish I did. I was always an avid studier of the Holocaust, movies, books. I could not believe that that went on in, our, in almost my lifetime. I wondered where the church was. Yes, there were people like Corey Ten Boone, great crusaders who risked their life and their family's life to help hide people during that horrible time. But he basically went unchallenged a lot. And I wondered why the people were silent. I said, surely, if I was there, I would have been one of those Corey Ten Boone people. And the Lord convicted my heart that not only was I not Corey Ten Boone, I was one of those people that was being quiet. By my silence against abortion, I was doing the same thing. And I had to repent to God to forgive me. I thought abortion was here to stay. I thought it was a judgment on our culture. I thought the pro-life movement was spitting in the wind. They felt bad about us and they were doing something because they felt bad about it, but I didn't think change could happen. I don't know why I felt that way, maybe because I never heard it talked about in my churches over, over the 30 plus years. We went one, two, three times a week. You know, um, the churches have been silent about it. And uh, I think that needs to change. Uh, that's what I feel God has given me a message for the churches. We need to wake up. I saw a movie three times. The first time I saw it, I was really called Amazing Grace. If anyone hasn't seen it, I would encourage you to go see it. It's about the life of Wilberforce, who was a friend of John Newton, who actually wrote the song Amazing Grace, who was a captain on a slave boat, who became a Christian and went into the monastery and spent the rest of his life serving God. John Newton did, but Wilberforce was a good friend of his. Wilberforce had a passion against slavery, and it was... It, he single-handedly ended slavery in his lifetime because of his passion for a righteous cause. There was no civil war like we had to have in America, but it was by court action that it ended. The second time I saw the movie, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, one man changed the nation. I, and I felt like I'm that one man, I'm that one woman. I can be that one voice. I will do that. And then my daughter died. Then I knew what I was going to speak about. This would have been the last thing I would have chose to have done, no offense, but if this was the only thing on the list that God gave me, I would say God is her plan B because, like I said, I thought it was impossible. But I have found, because of my involvement with the pro-life movement, that it is not impossible. Slavery ended. The Holocaust ended. Women got rights. That God, God is pro-life. Pro-life is not an activity. It's something, it's the heartbeat of God, I found that out. It's the closest things to God's heart. And we must align our heart with God's every second of every day, not for a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting or a yearly banquet. Our heart has to beat. There's innocent blood being shed even as I speak. I had this thought, if there was a maraud, a, a maraud of criminals going around the country, city to city, killing newborns, We'd be horrified. We'd take up visual aimies. We probably wouldn't sleep. We wouldn't eat. We'd, if they came to our town, we'd do anything we could to stop it. But you put white jackets on those people and stethoscopes around their neck and give them a room to do their business in. And all of a sudden, it's not as severe. It is severe. There is blood being shed. And I had to wake up. And I hope that everyone, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you people are already awake, but I wasn't awake. And the churches need to wake up. The pastors need to wake up. We can end abortion in our lifetime if we passionately serve this righteous cause with all our heart, all our heart, every second of every day. Thank you.